Good morning. It is a pleasure to be here with you today to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart, and that is about the care we provide, uh, courageous care. And what I'm going to start off talking a little bit about is what Simon Sinek talks about in his book, which is how great leaders inspire everyone to take action. And what he found and what he talks about is that leaders actually accomplish lots more when they start everything they do by first thinking about why they're doing it. And if you stop and think about it, the things we do in our day-to-day -day care, taking care of trauma patients, we can tell people what we do. We have procedural manuals and protocols and guidelines numerous times to tell us how to do it. Uh, but we sometimes don't stop and think about why we do what we do. And when you ask individuals about why they provide care to patients, they answer with things like they want to make a difference in the lives of others. They want their patients and families to achieve optimal outcomes. They, want, they care about others. And if you think about what the word care means, it's the effort made to do something correctly, safely, or without causing damage. Things done to keep someone healthy and safe. And when we think about the care that we provide, it is incredibly powerful. Uh, the care that we provide not only can alter people's physiologic parameters, but the care that we provide can actually foster healing, inspire hope, calm fear, alleviate pain, help others to learn, and comfort those who are grieving. The care that we provide is powerful, it's bold, resolute, and I think we'll all admit at times it's difficult, and yet it can be tremendously gratifying, and it takes tremendous courage to deliver that care. We're going to talk about today what courageous care is all about, but we're also going to talk about the four important vital aspects that we need to have to provide courageous care. The care we provide takes an incredible amount of strength and as I said, courage, that frankly many of those who don't walk in our shoes really appreciate. Do people really appreciate the courage and strength it takes to provide exceptional care to our patient, knowing that that individual may not survive? Do they realize the strength and courage it takes to comfort a loved one whose loved one in the bed has actually just had a devastating severe traumatic brain injury? Do they recognize the courage and strength it takes to be a resource to a family that's making really difficult end-of-life decisions for their loved one who's been, become dependent on life support? The fact is, it takes a lot of courage. And what about courage? John F. Kennedy says it's the most admirable of human virtues. Churchill said it's the first of human qualities because it is the quality which guarantees all others. And Roosevelt said, courage isn't the absence of fear, but rather the assessment that something else is more important than fear. We face our fears to do what we know is right, even when it's not easy, especially when it's not easy. Courageous care means doing what is necessary to provide the best possible care for our patients and families. So there, I, as I mentioned, there's four vital components to being able to provide great courageous care and the first of those is to be able to provide compassionate care. I don't think any of us or our loved ones would ever go to the hospital if we didn't at minimum expect to get safe care. And we all know that there's lots of errors that occur within hospitals, but we go in thinking that we're going to get safe care, believing that. It's really that ability to connect with patients and their families in compassionate ways that alleviates and prevents suffering that's key to improving the patient's experience. That's what truly makes the patient's perception of how they perceive the care that they receive. And there are numerous studies that demonstrate positive associations between better patient out experiences and improved health outcomes. So when we talk about compassionate care, what does compassion mean? It's the sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with a desire to alleviate it. So when we want to provide compassionate care, we need to be able to acknowledge the suffering of another. 
and then provide individualized, coordinated patient and family care that promotes their participation. We want to convey interest. We want to invoke trust from the patient and family and enhance the perception of empathy. Dempsey suggests one of the ways we can do that is by using the four P's. The first is to have proximity with the patient, being able to sit down and actually talk with the patient or with the family. Positioning ourselves so that we have good eye contact and proactively providing information in an understandable fashion that ensures the patient and family's comprehension. Now, I don't think anybody in this room would deny the fact that we probably learned a lot of these things in our training programs, how important it is to take that time with patients and families. But we also know that in our busy trauma centers and day-to-day -day care of patients, sometimes it's difficult to find the time to get those things done. But it's important to recognize how that really impacts the perception that the patient has of the care that we provide. When we provide compassionate care, it puts us at risk for a number of detrimental phenomenon. Compassion fatigue, moral distress, burnout, and change fatigue. Compassion fatigue is sometimes referred to as the cost of caring, and it is the reduced capacity or interest in being empathetic or bearing witness to others' suffering. It occurs after repeated exposures to stressful events of patients and families that you develop a special relationship with. And there's all kinds of indicators that compassion fatigue may be present. There may be physical indicators, extreme exhaustion, fatigue, feeling aches and pains, emotional findings where you have anxiety, sadness perhaps. Those are a few examples. Social where you want to just be isolated and you don't find pleasure in the things you used to. Work indicators. You dread going to work or taking care of certain kinds of patients. Your productivity's dropped. You make more errors. You call out sick more. And you may leave your job. And there may be spiritual indicators as well where you really question your spirituality. Moral distress can also be problematic. It's when you know the ethically appropriate action to take, but you're unable to act upon it. You act in a manner that's contrary to your personal and professional values, which really undermines your integrity and authenticity. And one in three nurses is said to have moral distress, oftentimes coming from feeling like they're providing futile care to a patient. This also can cause physical and emotional stress, loss of job satisfaction, perhaps turnover, and reduced quality of care. The American Association of Critical Care Nurses does have a program called the Four A's to Rise Above Moral Distress that can be really helpful in recognizing and in intervening with moral distress. Third is burnout, and burnout affects all type of professionals, and it has reached epidemic proportions. Just within nurses, we know that as many as a third of critical care nurses have severe burnout. 86% have at least one of the three classic symptoms, which we'll talk about in a second. But the bottom line is this problem is so great that the American Association of Critical Care Nurses partnered with their colleagues in the Critical Care Society's Consortium, and that is the Society of Critical Care Medicine, the American Thoracic Society, and chest physicians, to actually put on forums at each of their respective annual conferences that addressed burnout, and they've recently, at the beginning of the summer of 2016, put out joint publications in each of their respective journals about burnout, talking about what it is, what's causing it, its consequences, and what we need to look towards for prevention and treatment. Burnout's caused by work-related stressors, long hours, perhaps insufficient staffing, feeling like you just have huge workloads, perhaps feeling like you're inadequately compensated or recognized for that care, poor teamwork, all of those can contribute to burnout. Burnout develops gradually. You initially feel some emotional stress and increased job-related disillusionment, and over time you develop negative attitudes, but not just about your job, also your coworkers and your patients. Eventually, those three symptoms of burnout, emotional exhaustion, which is really a most prominent symptom, 
reduced personal accomplishment and depersonalization, feeling disconnected from your work, become evident, as well as other physical symptoms that similar to what I talked about with compassion fatigue. Not recognizing burnout will result in an endless supply of toxicity throughout all aspects of life. It has negative effects on both the health and physical, mental health and physical well-being of providers. It causes increase in turnover and poor work performance, which reduces quality of care, decreasing patient family satisfaction, there's higher mortality rates, increased hospital acquired infections, and more errors. And last but not least, change fatigue. And as much as we'd like things not to change, we know they do. And in healthcare, change is rapid and rampant. And that rapid and continuous change creates even more overwhelming feelings of stress, exhaustion, and burnout. The bottom line is, though, is that the old adage rings true. You can't care for others if you don't care for yourself. And it takes courage to recognize the need to renew yourself, to take time to restore yourself so that you can provide courageous care to others. There's no one randomized control trial that tells us how to prevent or how to treat these different phenomenon. But we do know there are some things that are helpful, and there's researchers across the country working on this. The first thing is self-awareness. Billie Jean King said, I think self-awareness is probably the most important thing toward being a champion. And that same can be true towards being an expert healthcare provider. We need to take a look at ourselves. Do we see some of these findings of these different detrimental phenomenon within ourselves? If we do, we need to take that time to renew ourselves, find activities that restore ourselves, and perhaps ask for help. Not easy or intuitive for those of us who care for others. The bottom line is, too, though, is that we oftentimes don't see these symptoms in ourselves. We don't see these phenomenon being present. So I suggest that you have a colleague, perhaps a family member or a friend, who can really speak to you about the impact your work is having on your life and listen to what they're saying and heed the advice to, again, reach out and take time to renew yourself. Now, what are some things we can do? Well, first, be clear on your why. Your why gives meaning to your work. We can also take time to relax, reduce stress, doing that by practicing mindfulness, meditation, or perhaps yoga. Now, I don't know how you all feel, but if somebody asked me to get into that pose, I would be looking at a C2 fracture in no time flat. The good news is they have taught small animals to do these things, so there is hope for us, uh, those of us who aren't all that flexible. The other thing is it's important to pay attention to your time management. The more full our plates get, the more stressed we feel and the harder it is to develop our resilience. So I love this quote by Stephen Covey. He says, you, don't, you have to decide what your highest priorities are and have the courage to pleasantly, smilingly, non-apologetically say no to other things. And the way you do that is to have a bigger yes burning inside. We can also take time to rest, exercise, eat healthy. Those all sound like good things to do. Uh, take time to share your stories. Healthcare providers can tell the grossest stories while eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner and just laugh their heads off. Um, and taking time to find balance, getting involved in hobbies, social activities. Uh, Cinda Rushton clearly showed that uh, those that had strong spirituality tend to have less symptoms of burnout and use of support systems. Now, I know there are many of you in the audience that are thinking, McQuillan, you have no idea. I barely have time to go to the bathroom, no less try to take time to rest, exercise, get a hobby, and do all of these other things. Well, I'm going to suggest there's one thing you can do even while you are going to the bathroom that can help you build your resilience. And that is I want you to stop and think about how you talk to yourself. And if you're anything like me, particularly after I've lost my glasses for the third time in one day, I can say some pretty awful things to myself. The problem with that is, is you listen to that. And so every day, 
think about something that went really well with your work. It could be something simple, like a family member asking if you're back tomorrow because they really hope you can take care of their loved one again. Something simple, like trying to really, or being able to accomplish some of your goals in managing different parameters in the patient. It can be any number of things, but dwell on those positive things that can help you, again, renew yourself and foster your resilience. We not only need to respect ourselves in the way we talk to ourselves, but we need to respect each other. And that gets to the importance of healthy work environments. That is incredibly important. We must have healthy work environments in order to drive clinical excellence and achieve optimal patient outcomes. And yet we know from research that was published by Beth Ulrich and her colleagues where they actually surveyed 8,444 critical care nurses that the health of our work environments is actually perceived to have deteriorated since the survey was last done in 2008. In March of this year, the American Association of Critical Care Nurses published the second edition of their Healthy Work Environment Standards, and those standards are even stronger than the initial edition in providing the evidence that shows the impact of unhealthy work environments on us as healthcare providers and our patients. There's greater numbers of nurses and physicians and others who have burnout when they have unhealthy work environments. They also have less job satisfaction. We also know that when health and work environments are unhealthy, we know that there is less error interception, there's more hospital acquired infections, and there's less patient and family satisfaction. So it's important to look at do we have skilled communication, authentic leadership, meaningful recognition, appropriate staffing, effective decision making and true collaboration, the six healthy work environment standards. Uh, there is the ability to go to the AACN website, sign your unit up, folks on your unit can take the survey and you can see where you may have opportunities for improvement and put together action plans to improve the health of your work environments. We can also use tools to enhance good communication and build teamwork. We can have team debriefings, for example. Has anyone here ever practiced the pause? There's a nurse from University of Virginia by the name of Jonathan Bartle who first introduced the concept of the pause, recognizing that his colleagues were becoming increasingly fatigued with trying to resuscitate patients and when they didn't live, those patients were moved out as quickly as possible to get ready for the next patient without a blink of an eye. And he decided to try just having the healthcare team pause for just about 45 to 90 seconds to be able to recognize that loss of life and all of the hard work that was done, but to really be able to uh, pause and uh, be able to regroup after the death of that patient. It is something, having uh, actually practiced the pause in my own healthcare facility a few times, it is something that can really help the team to regroup and help foster resilience. Scheduling and looking at uh, your time off is helpful for fostering resilience, as are being clear on patient family goals and using various different services like palliative care and ethics as appropriate. But building resilience has wonderful dividends. It's associated with less PTSD and burnout, also increases institutional loyalty, so you have less turnover, cultivates engagement, and boosts empathy and compassionate care. The third component that is so important to have in place when you're actually providing courageous care is that you must build and maintain a strong knowledge base. We all know that our patients are increasingly complex. We heard our first speaker talk today about geriatric patients, and they come oftentimes to us with lots of comorbidities that make our care more challenging. We also have patients that are supported on lots of sophisticated technology, so we need to have a sound knowledge base and strong critical thinking skills. But with the change in our environments, just being oriented is not enough. We have to commit to a continuum of lifelong learning. We all know that over time, our courageous care develops. When we first took care of our patients, we were pretty scared. Every single person had that element of fear but backed up by mentors, preceptors, teachers, 
we actually continued to provide that care and we got stronger. And so that now many of us in this room serve as preceptors, mentors, teachers to others. Our courageous care has developed over time. And we practice courageous care whenever we say we don't know something and we take the time to go and learn about it so we can provide the best care for our patients and families. And the thing that's kind of odd is the more you learn, the more questions you have. But you have to be courageous in asking those questions, even when you're sure everybody else knows the answer. Because those questions provide the ability to perhaps come up with new ideas to better take care of patients or perhaps to do research. So whether you learn best by coming to conferences like this, reading books or journals or looking at reputable websites, that continuum of learning is incredibly important. They say that courage is contagious. That's what Brene Brown says, and I truly believe that. I believe one of the most incredibly rewarding aspects of being a healthcare provider is not only being able to provide courageous care to my patients, but to help others eventually as my courageous care has grown to help them navigate their learning path. When we take that role on as a mentor, preceptor, teacher, we take on an incredible responsibility because we must demonstrate the behavior that we want that person that we're teaching or mentoring or precepting to emulate. The true measure of your leadership will not be your greatest achievements, but the number of great leaders that you turn out. How many people here have ever gone crabbing for Maryland blue crabs? Anybody here? It's always less as I move further west. Well, I love to catch crabs. I also love to eat crabs with cold beer. But with that said, uh, a lot of people use fancy traps and things to catch crabs. I actually prefer to use the old-fashioned method, where you take a piece of string, you tie it to the end. Uh, on the end, you put a piece of a, usually a chicken neck or a chicken leg, and you throw it in the water. And then when you see that piece of string wiggle or you feel it wiggle, you slowly pull the string up. Get your net in the water, and as soon as you see the shadow of the crab, you net that crab and you throw it into a wooden basket that looks just like this. And we rarely have to put a lid on that basket. And the reason is, is that those crabs very, very rarely get out of the basket. And the reason is, is that if one of the crabs attempts to crawl out, the other crabs below typically latch on and pull it right back down. <laughs> we call that crabism. And I will tell you that we have some problems with that uh, amongst ourselves as well, where sometimes we pull each other down instead of lifting each other up. In 2015, the American Association of Critical Care Nurses had a burnout forum that was attended by hundreds of nurses. And one of the leading causes of unhealthy work environments and burnout was described by nurses in that forum as bullying by their peers. In Allrich's survey that was done, over 20% of the nurses who responded said that respect among their peers was only fair or poor. And I think all of us in this room may have either experienced or have been witnessed to instances where colleagues are talking about some concern about the care that another colleague was providing, and yet not one person had the courage to go to that individual and provide constructive criticism or tell them what they thought they could do differently. What I would like to suggest is instead of being like the feisty Maryland blue crab, we'd be more like the Canada geese. Canadian geese, as you know, fly from north and south, and as they do, they fly in a V-shaped formation, and that's to prevent some of the, uh, provide a little airlift and uh, actually ease that journey for the geese that follow behind. And when one of the geese becomes ill or injured, two other geese fall out of formation and stay with that ill or injured goose until they can eventually join another flock that comes by. And it is truly that courageous care that we provide to our colleagues that can be so helpful in developing them individually, building teamwork, improving the health of our work environments, and actually fostering excellence in care delivery in our particular settings, as well as 
achieving optimal patient outcomes. The take home message is don't be a crab, be a goose. It is incredibly important that we not pull each other down, but that we find ways to help each other overcome barriers so that we can make our optimal contributions and provide the best possible care to our patients and their families. The fourth component of courageous care is leadership. Cynic tells us that we can all learn to lead. Mark Sanborn says, we can be leaders that make a positive difference regardless of our position and title. So regardless of what our position is in the healthcare team, we can all help to lead great courageous care for our patients and their families. Gus Lee tells us that the backbone of leadership is courage. It's the single most decisive trait in a leader. And there's three acts of courageous leadership, honoring all persons. He points out that respect is incredibly important. It builds teamwork. Encouraging and supporting others. When we encourage, we give courage to others. Challenging the wrongs in ourselves and in others. We can use the transformational power of courage to lead effective change. But I said change is difficult but not changing can be fatal. So despite the fact that change is rapid and rampant, it sometimes is a good thing, although, as I said, it can be difficult. But if we don't drive change, change will drive us. People will tell us what we need to do instead of us being in the driver's seat. Change can be scary, but you know what's scarier? Allowing fear to stop you from growing, evolving, and progressing. So whether at the bedside, in the classroom, or in the boardroom, it's important that we muster the courage to drive change that optimizes patient outcomes. That means we need to engage frontline providers and nurses in change and teach them the, the actual skills for leadership. Mark Miller wrote a book called The Heart of Leadership, Being the Leader People Want to Follow. And he talks about the fact that only 10% of our success as a leader comes from our leadership skill. 90% comes from our leadership character. And he uses the acronym HEART to spell out what those important virtues of leadership character are. Hunger for wisdom. Wisdom is what gives us the information to make good decisions. Expect the best. Successful leaders are optimistic people. They come with solutions, not just problems. Accept responsibility, respond with courage, and think of others first. Paradoxically, pausing for a while can actually power purposeful performance. And so when you're leading change, Kevin Cashman, who wrote The Pause Principle, tells you that leaders oftentimes do need to stop and think about new ways of being and achieving. Great leaders do not tell people how to change. They inspire people to change. And they do that by being very clear on why the change is important and helping to engage others in embracing that why and therefore wanting to participate in that change. Courage is not something we are born with. It's actually something that we learn, grow, and develop. And we can easily include first responders as being courageous individuals, as well as those of us who care for patients in other settings as well. So briefly, how do we grow and develop our courage? Well, John Maxwell says, do something to stretch yourself. He suggests skydiving. I'm thinking not so much for me. But I will tell you that, uh, just in a, in a nutshell, um, I come from an athletic family. Everybody plays sports. And uh, they kind of got on my case one time because I was trying to give them a little advice, particularly my son, who was a very good cross-country runner, about how he may pick up a little bit of speed. And he reminded me that I had never played a sport. I guess glee club didn't count in high school. and. Uh, so I decided, well, I'm going to take up a sport. I went to my husband. I said, gosh, I want to take up a sport, but nothing with balls. I don't like things flying around. Um, and he said, why don't you try that one where it looks like they're scrubbing the floors? Of course, he thought he was being funny. Uh, but I looked it up, and lo and behold, sure enough, the following weekend, the National Curling Center had an open house which, by the way, they recently opened a curling center in Phoenix, Arizona. 
Uh, I joined the Women's League. It was awesome. I, it's an awesome sport. It's a lot of fun, but it took an incredible amount of courage on my part to do that. But I will tell you, it taught me a lot about myself, and it taught me about taking risks and being courageous. The other thing John Maxwell says is have difficult conversations. Have reasons you value. Be clear on your why. Recognize that you're afraid and face your fear. Use your support systems and remember the successes and build on them. Sandra Walston, who purports herself as a courage expert, suggests similar types of things. Affirming your strength and determination. Working around obstacles and manifesting a vision, being clear on your why. She suggests that we learn and develop ourselves and surround ourselves with the people we want to be like. If you surround yourself with toxic individuals, you will become intoxicated. Speak up. Challenge those talking about others and challenge the status quo. Being called to do what you fear the most is a direct route towards experiencing just how powerful, resourceful, and brave and amazing you really are. Well, from my lecture, you may have gathered that I have two children. I have a son who is every trauma nurse's worst nightmare. Um, he is an avid skateboarder. He's pretty good at it. And yes, we have had the helmet conversation about three gazillion times. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, love him to death. Uh, but he is a skateboarder in every stretch of the means. He loves it. My daughter is a pediatric ICU nurse. And I have had the absolute joy in being able to follow and watch her courageous care build. And she oftentimes calls me as she drives home from work or when she gets home from work to tell me a little bit about her day. And most of the time she's really happy and she's telling me about wonderful things that happened and a baby who something happened to for the first time or a family that said something nice. But sometimes she's crying. And I remind her that not all days are going to be good. We need to learn from those tough days. And we need to find joy in those days that go really well and allow them to inspire us and to give us the energy to go back and provide courageous care to others. We all have stories of how we've provided courageous care. Many of us do it every single day. Remember those stories. Share them with each other. They remind you of the exceptional care that you provide. They remind you that you drive excellence and that you do what's right for patients and families. And they remind us that we have the greatest jobs in the world and that we provide courageous care with skill, compassion, conviction, and above all else, courage. Thank you.